Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Now then, the new Prime Minister has a really hard balancing act ahead of her, as we were discussing in the paper review. Much of British business is desperate for the UK to stay inside the single market, which probably would not mean slashing immigration. But on the other side, many Tory activists are deeply worried that the new government will betray the referendum result and Brexit won't quite mean Brexit. Patrick McLaughlin, as the party chairman, is the man in the middle. Good morning to you. Morning, Andrew. Before we come on to Brexit, another European-related story, which is, of course, these terrible, terrible tailbacks. Some people sitting for 15 hours in boiling weather in their cars with children, desperate for police or anyone else to thrust them water. This has been an absolute horlicks of a mess. Um, why has it happened? Well, I think we can understand why the French would want to increase security after what happened in Nice last week. Of course. Um, and... I think that is understandable that their uh, risk uh, rose. Uh, what is unacceptable is just the way in which people have been left in the lurch. And, At one point, uh, and there was the, apparently just one indeed, person indeed, checking passports absolutely. on the French Well, side. one person checking the coaches, as I understand it. Mm. And that is just purely unacceptable. And uh, I know there have been discussions between uh, our government and the French government to uh, make sure that we try and ease the situation as much as we possibly can. But I think one does have to uh, acknowledge that uh, the horrendous mm. incident in Nice uh, would have put the French authorities on much higher alert. And you think it's all about that? There's no suggestion that they're going to give us a little bit of a punishment for Brexit? No, I, I don't think so. I, I don't think so at all. I, you mm. know, to the, to the French and to us, tourism is a very important industry and nobody wants to see people starting their okay. holidays getting uh, frustrated in the way that they are and held up. Same part of the country, but not something for which we can blame the French, is the terrible disaster of Southern Rail. Again, all this summer, people have been unable to see their children at night when they're coming home, unable to get into work at time. Huge numbers of trains have been cancelled. It, again, has been a terrible mess. And it goes down to a contract that you signed with them, which means that they do not have any... Uh, hard financial penalties for not being able to deliver the service? Well, look, the simple fact is we are seeing record investment in our railways. We're seeing record investment. No, no, this is quite important because this is actually about an industrial dispute. This is about whether the RMT will accept driver-only operated trains. And, and the simple fact is lots of trains already in Southern run on driver-operated only trains. We're buying in new trains, new services. We're seeing record investment. And we're so, seeing an industrial dispute. And you're saying it's nothing to do with the company at all? Well, uh, the company has some responsibility. Of course the company has some responsibility. But the main reason why we've got the problems we've got is because of an industrial dispute. Look, there will always be times on the railways where sometimes the problem is uh, with the rail infrastructure. Mm -hmm. uh, we've, we've not this been seems to be absolute management and competence, frankly. I mean, Claire Perry resigned partly because of that. Don't you hold some responsibility for this different kind of contract you signed, where they get all the money up front and therefore aren't under no. real financial pressure no, no, to they deliver? Do, they do lose money, but the simple fact is this is, a fact, this is an industrial dispute. The RMT have been on strike, but they've also had positions where sickness levels have risen immeasurably as far as uh, people not reporting in for work and one can only draw the conclusions that part of that is part of the dispute that's taking place but so, i want to so, see that okay. service so, so running no properly as as will chris grayley no change what kind of comfort can you offer those people living in brighton the south coast or in london moving in the other direction whose lives have been completely ruined by this who have lost jobs um, you know, relationships have been damaged, family relationships have been damaged, and it goes on and on and on. Well, obviously, Chris Grayling will be looking at uh, what uh, measures he, he can take now as the Transport Secretary. But, you know, I, I want to see that investment. I want to see those new trains. You know, London Bridge, which is causing some of the problems, is going under a £700 million uh, re, uh, refurbishment. Right. That will lead to a better service. OK, let's turn then to Brexit, as, as, as I suggested at the beginning of the interview. Um, on the one hand, you have a lot of companies desperate to, kind of, in some way, keep into the, in, in the single market. Boris Johnson has suggested there's going to be some kind of compromise could be done. And there's a very interesting story in The Observer today suggesting that, as he thought would happen, the French, at least, are saying, do you know what? We can do a deal. We can, uh, we can give you less immigration and you can stay in the single market. For a lot of your supporters, that would be a betrayal of the Brexit vote. 
Well, let's, let us see. We're only in the, we're four weeks on from when the referendum took place. I'm quite clear that uh, the referendum result is binding on, on Parliament. Technically it isn't, but I'm clear that it is uh, binding on Parliament. The Prime Minister has made it very clear that Brexit means Brexit. But uh, what does Brexit mean? Well, Brexit means that we're coming out of the uh, European Union. Uh, we want to see uh, our own borders under our control. And we, we obviously want to see the best we can for British investment. Now, we have seen some large inward investment taking place as, after the Brexit vote. A lot of the 17 million people who voted for Brexit assumed it would mean an end to mass migration from Europe. Will it? Well, I think that you can't say that the 17 million people who voted... I think there were several reasons why people voted to mm. uh, leave the European Union. Uh, so I don't think you can say it's one particular area. But it does mean that we have to have control of our borders, yes. So there will be... You are going to bring uh, immigration from the EU down considerably absolutely definitely and in short order yes well you say short order we've got to wait and see exactly when we do when we leave the European Union once article uh, 50 is served then there is a two-year a maximum two-year process it may be sooner than that uh, that will be part of the negotiations which will the Prime Minister is leading will article 50 definitely be triggered before the general election oh yes so that means there is not uh, under any circumstances going to be an early general election to catch the Labour Party with their trousers down well, and it's, it's very difficult them. to have an early general election with the fixed term parliaments. I mean, there are elections every year. We'll have the county council elections. Those are what I'm turning my attention to at the moment. Those are the next elections on the uh, domestic scene. But um, with a fixed term parliament uh, act in place, okay. it's very difficult to call an early general election. At the core of your job, really, is relations between the voluntary party, the party in the country, and the MPs. And there's been a sense for quite a long time now that the party in the country has been slightly looked down on, slightly disregarded by the people at the top of the party. There was the chumocracy, so-called, and the old Etonians at the top of the party. And uh, issues like gay marriage, which um, David Cameron keeps saying is his great legacy, uh, offended a lot of your ordinary party members. Is that era now over? Do we see a different relationship now between the leadership of the party and the ordinary members? Governments always have to govern in the national interest, and we're going to see Theresa May govern in the national interest. And sometimes that will upset some members of a political party. But uh, first and foremost, you've got to put the national interest first. That's what uh, the Prime Minister will want to do. Uh, as far as... Uh, I came up through the Conservative Party. Mm. I owe my place around the Cabinet table to me joining the Young Conservatives, becoming a National Vice Chairman, a District Councillor, a County Councillor. We've got thousands of people right across the country that put tremendous efforts into the Conservative Party. I want to thank them for the work they do and I want to encourage more people to join the party. Well, you say more people because there's 150,000 more or less, which compared with the new Labour Party is tiny. You have to reach out much more. Do you want to get a, a young a younger, more working-class kind of member than you've had before? I, I want the party to be open to everybody. And one of the things we've got to do is to say what will, what will make people, what will encourage people to join political parties. Uh, it has been sort of something that uh, people have felt uh, sort of dis disbarred from, and I want to change that. If you get a, a, um, a join the Labour Party and you pay your £25 or whatever, you can have a say, not just in who is the party leader, but on party policy of all kinds. If you join the Conservative Party, you don't that get that kind of say. So why would people want to join well, the Well, I'm not party? sure you don't get that say. I think we, we need to look at uh, what used to be called the uh, CPC in my younger days, which uh, spread through policy. Would you I, like I don't it to be more democratic? Uh, well, when you say democratic, I think the party is in incredibly democratic. Well, they don't get a vote. They don't get well, a vote would, on policy. They would have got a vote on... Uh, well, I, d I don't think... They would have got a vote on the leader, except you didn't let... You know, it was stitched up at Westminster. Governments... Gov well, mm. it wasn't stitched up. It was, uh, mm. it was decided in Westminster. <laughs> and when I look at what's happening in the Labour Party, I'm, I'm not sure there. Uh, I mean, the idea that you can have a leader of a parliamentary party that's got no support on his back benches is a new, uh, is a new uh, thing mm. that we're getting used to in British right. politics. OK, Patrick McLaughlin, thank you very much indeed for talking to us. I've been